It is the 15th of April, 1990. The man you see in this footage is called Tibor Nagy. Today, once again, he will welcome the people who have been his followers for years. A very special anniversary is being prepared for here at the crossroads at Grand Central. And the story of how Tibor Nagy comes to be celebrating it is one of the strangest ever to befall a man. Tibor Nagy's real story started 36 years ago on the 15th of April, 1954, the day of his 40th birthday. Tibor, his wife, Helene, and their daughter, Esther, then 12 years old, set off in their car for Woolworth, where Helene's sister lives. There are two possible routes from Cape Town to Woolworth, Route 27, just open to traffic, and Route 4, the old road, now empty of heavy vehicles. It is here, 25 miles out, that the Nagy's whole life will reach a turning point. It was about 10.15, Tibor would later declare, when a huge shadow stopped right above us and brought the car to a standstill. Nothing would work. My wife screamed. My daughter started to cry. I told them not to be afraid. And then it seemed like night fell all round us. I don't know how much later, when I opened my eyes, we were all in the car, and the car was in a round white room which was vibrating gently. I got out of the car and suddenly, right in front of me, I saw the moon coming at me. So I took out my camera, which I always take with me when we have little get-togethers, and I filmed. I was shaking with fear. Good God, was I frightened. Abban a pillanatban a lányom fölézett. Megpróbáltam megmagyarázni neki, hogy repülés és a élet szól minket. Ugyanekkor egy férfi lépett be a szobába. At the same moment, my daughter woke up, and I had to explain to her that I believe we have been picked up by a flying truck. At the same second, a man stepped into the room. Man, what was he like? He seemed like us, but he was wearing a helmet on his head, and I couldn't see his face. He didn't say anything, but we understood that we needn't be afraid, and that I could film whatever I saw, but not the inside of the ship. I remember perfectly saying, yes, sir, and my daughter yelling, we're higher than the moon. I watched and filmed. I filmed till I was out of film. And then I felt like we were falling. When I opened my eyes, my wife and my daughter were at the back of the car, and we were a few meters away from a road we didn't know. And I told my wife and my daughter, God wants to test us. We must be brave. 36 years later, Tibor Nagy has taken his car back to the same place. All around him, every detail has been recreated down to the field which has been cut the same way, and his words remain the same. When I opened my eyes, my wife and my daughter were at the back of the car. And we were a few meters apart, away from the road we didn't know really. And I told my wife and my daughter, God wants to put us to test. We must be courageous. No one believed Tibor Nagy's story. Those of us who remember the period will know that scarcely a day went by without some Ohio farmer or fisherman from San Francisco seeing a flying saucer. However, what makes the Nagy affair different is that he is the first to have managed to bring back proof. And that proof is his film, which you are going to see in a few moments. He may have convinced us, but not the investigators. Their surprise soon gave way to mistrust. And Tibor is taken for a hoaxer who just wanted to get himself talked about. It's said that he is the owner of his garage thanks to an opportune marriage. Within a few weeks, things start to go downhill for the Nagy family. Everyone is waiting for Tibor to own up and confess that the whole thing had been staged. 
Tibor refuses to do so, saying that he'll bring further proofs. If only the ones who had once carried him off would come again, he would be sure to recognize them and so be able to prove that he, Tibor Nagy, is not a liar. In February of 1955, the entire Nagy family settles in this tiny garage facing the crossroads at Grand Central. Four years later, his wife contracts pleurisy, which gets the better of her. His daughter goes back to live in Woolworth, where she will get married before going off to live in Canada so as never to see her father again. Ever since that day in 1954, Tibor waits in the place where they set him down. Over the years, the village has grown in population, but there is still an exclusion zone around his garage. His followers have named him the Madman of the Crossroads, but not in a derogatory way. On the contrary, Tibor is as respected as a man who has met God in person. And it is as if one were setting foot in a shrine on that day when, in remembrance of all his trials, he shows his film. It was April 15, that day, Helen, my wife, and Esther, our daughter, and myself, we should have gone to visit and Martha in Woolworth. That was my 40th birthday. And it became dark. And when I opened my eyes, I saw the moon, like you are seeing it there. And then we have flown over it. And I woke up. I thought being on earth, but I was in hell. The publicity given by the press to this affair was a kind of protection for Tibor Nagy. Others were less fortunate. Two years later, the inhabitants of this hamlet, situated two miles from the spot where Tibor had been carried off, and about which nothing was ever asked during the investigation, were evacuated, and sometime later the houses were burned to the ground on the road that led to them completely obliterated. Why did they want so badly to wipe out all trace of the Nagy affair? This home video, unique of its kind, is a warning. It was put together by Mr. father of Peter and responsible for shooting the footage. Even as we tell you of it now, this story has only just reached its conclusion. As you are about to hear, Peter's father doesn't tell us everything. Far from it. And a lot of things remain mysterious. Wherever possible, we have tried to cast some light on those shadowy areas. The 30th October, 1979. My son and his mother leaving the hospital. Peter was born on the 14th October. The examinations were endless. I haven't found the matron. I'm convinced she lied to us. Sixteen days after his birth, Peter at last came home and our life changed. We didn't go out anymore. We didn't have anyone round. In these pictures, Peter is exactly a month old. Since we got back from hospital, we hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. His mother and I were happy and regaining our confidence. At three months, Peter was a very quiet child who smiled in his sleep, so we were sure that any danger was remote. Here, for reasons we don't know, the father's commentary ceases for several minutes. We'll get it back later. The images which follow perhaps explain this silence. It seems it all started towards the sixth month. Watch carefully. The mother is playing with Peter. While his mother's attention is elsewhere, the child looks up at his toy and the toy rises. It was the father who slowed down these images himself by way of silent commentary on this thing they'd been dreading all along. It is now the 14th of October, 1980. What has happened over the last six months, we shall never know. The parents enter the room and find the curtains of the bed, as you can see, in disorder. These knots, which the father comes back onto, prove it could not have been merely a breeze or the curtains coming unhooked while the child was asleep, but that it was the child himself who exercised his willpower on them. 
and if any more proof was needed, the child provided it the very next day, the 15th of October, when once again they found the curtains, this time in an improbable and it must be said rather disturbing position, and the parents do not hide their emotion. But how can they have let him do it? It's unlikely that they would not have kept an eye on the child alerted by the events of the day before. But those images we will never see, since they doubtless confirm to the parents that Peter would never be like other children. Here, our little boy is 18 months old. He has been under the doctors for six months. We are told that it will all pass given time and that we should carry on as if nothing was happening. It's true that at first Peter only used his power on insignificant things, but despite all our efforts, we had trouble coming to terms with the extraordinary. And as time passed, what happened was the exact opposite of what they had predicted to us, as we finally understood on Christmas Day, when Peter, who was three and a half, started to truly master his power. As you will see twice, he managed to unhook the balls from the tree, just one at first, but then he was so proud of what he'd done that he kept three of them up above his head with an ease that was entirely new. This was the first time he managed to display several objects at the same time. During these moments, Peter was so happy that we were quite disarmed. It was my parents who advised me to do laboratory experiments. I'll remember this day all my life. Peter was in an isolation chamber, and a man was asking him to make the foam rubber ball in front of him move. Peter couldn't do it and seemed completely lost. We couldn't speak to him. So what was he thinking of? Did he think we'd leave him there? Was he afraid of something? We never spoke roughly to him. Did he feel threatened by this doctor who kept giving him orders? Did the man use a gesture or expression that Peter could have misinterpreted? We have asked ourselves these questions and many others over and over again, trying to find an explanation for what happened. Peter tried to explain that he couldn't do anything with the ball. So the doctor asked him to concentrate on him and to look into his eyes. Peter complied, and a few seconds later, the doctor staggered out of the room and said to us, I pity you, he's a monster. Ever since that day, we've kept Peter completely isolated, fearing that he might turn into a fairground attraction. Sensing what he was capable of, we saw nobody anymore. We lived with his power like a handicap that had to be completely hidden. We were helpless, we didn't know what to do. But these little family moments remind me how happy the three of us were. We were living a sort of secret life, completely turned in on ourselves, and I don't think we ever realized just how used to it Peter had become. He didn't mind at all spending his days in the garden with no one for company except his parents and the dog he was so intensely attached to. Here, the father's commentary stops once again. The rest is written in haste, but from what we have heard, we can have an idea of the final drama. Look carefully at this photo, which brings together everyone. We have good reason to believe it was taken on the eve of the terrible events. Who would think from these smiling faces that in a matter of a few hours, this family will be doubly hit? Our inquiry has established that the next day they were all to go to home of the school, specializing in children who, like Peter, show the particularities that you now know about. The first words scribbled by the father are, I told him that we wouldn't be able to take the dog. Peter's reaction is not slow in coming. It is every bit as intense and final as the love he had for the animal. He couldn't take the idea of being separated, continues the father, and there was nothing we could do to calm him down. What Peter is capable of is terrifying. What happened a bit later when his mother attempted to reason with him, I was not able to film. What happened was an accident. I am leaving this cassette behind as testimony. Don't anybody try to find us. It's not his fault. I love my son. This story reached its denouement less than a year ago. After the events you have just seen, Mr. fled with Peter into a mountainous region. They would hide there for seven years. During the winter of 1990, Mr. fell gravely ill. Peter, who was just 11 years old, decided to go down to the valley. He managed to cross the Snowdin Hills and thus save the life of his father. Today, Peter has lost none of his powers and is cared for in a specialist institute.
Thank <laughs> you.